Happy Wellness Wednesday. Uh, today uh, we have a very, very special guest, uh, Dr. Candice Bruno, uh, and uh, also my lovely co-host, uh, Rachel. Uh, actually, uh, a little confession, I have a little bit worsening allergies today, uh, you know, just happens once, uh, you know, once in a while. So <clears throat> if I'm coughing and sneezing from once in a while again, then just please forgive me and uh, I'll do my best not to. And uh, Rachel can be we'll probably doing a lot more talking, but I'll, I'll drop in as I get a chance. Uh, yeah. Um, and just really quick for our viewers, if you were tuning in, um, the email today did say with Dr. Chuck Renner um, talking about the decompression bed, we are still planning on doing that. That'll be a later date and he'll pop in at the end to give us a preview. So um, that's what we're, but today we have a really interesting guest, um, Dr. Candice Bruno. She is a so I would have called you a holistic dentist, but I see you're putting the word biologic dentist. So maybe you can kind of just jump in and explain that piece to us. Yeah, so um, holistic dentistry, biologic dentistry, more or less the same thing, just different words for different approaches. But biologic meaning um, looking at the things that affect the body and the biology of the body. And so um, holistic tends to sometimes go hand in hand with no treatment or swish and oil, something like that. Whereas biologic is still attention to dentistry and how it affects the body, but in an approach that's still bringing in something to help the body be better, but maybe not full pharmaceutical, maybe not fluoride, maybe not doing certain types of fillings, things like that. So I stray away from holistic just because sometimes it can put the word out there that you're out there and you don't believe in toothpaste of any sort and you treat decay by doing nothing. And okay, that's so not it's really just to clear up misconceptions about how teeth get, get treated. So exactly. then I'm, so biologic dentistry. So you're mm -hmm. a biologic dentist. So how, um, how did you get into that? Why did you decide that was the path? Well, I knew in college that I wanted to do something in the health field. Um, I ended up choosing dentistry mainly because I didn't want somebody to be dying on my table. I didn't feel like I could handle that stress. However, dentistry never really fit for me when I got out of dental school. Um, it was something where I did it, but I didn't like it. And so um, my mom had had ovarian cancer. She passed away back in 2009 and before I got out of dental school. So she had already started bringing my attention to toxicities and certain plastics and I'm not allowed to cook in aluminum and no styrofoam in the microwave, things like that. Um, and then when I became a dentist, I realized that there was a lot of toxic things in my field um, and things that I didn't necessarily feel comfortable putting into my patients and things that I had concerns about as well. At that point in time, um, it didn't fit in my personal life to be a biologic dentist because I was married to a dentist as well. And so it was too far on the opposite side. Um, but because of the toxicity issues that I was aware of, it was what I was driven towards. And so I had read a book called Mouth Matters. Um, Carol Vanderstoke wrote that. And I found biologic dentistry in that book. And so I had moved to Austin. I reached out to Dr. Griffin Cole, who was a biologic dentist mentioned in the book, and kind of learned, hey, how do you bring our two worlds together? And so it was something that was of interest to me. When I got divorced, I then decided to go fully into biologic dentistry and started with the IAOMT, which is the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, and then just started kind of baby stepping. Um, so with biologic dentists, you start on a continuum. There is no actual path for you. So it's kind of starting with, typically we all smart with like, start with a smart removal or safe mercury removal. Um, so I started there and then as I learned certain things, I developed my skill a little bit more and branched further out into biologic dentistry. And so now as a whole, what I do is I look at the body as a whole. I look at what toxic burden is on the body. Um, I look at in my field, what can I do to relieve some of that toxic burden on the patient? And then also, if the patient is cropping with a lot of autoimmune things or inflammatory things, what might be going on? Getting them to functional medicine or even kinesiologists if needed. And then figuring out 
what materials I can use in that patient to help them not have an inflammatory response from something that I do. So. Yeah. So walk us through like, so, you know, one of the first things you said kind of starting on that continuum is removing the mercury. Do do patients come in and present with very specific set of symptoms or do you see a recurring set of symptoms kind of with that issue? Um, so I've got a lot of all over the place patients at this point in time. So originally I was pulling more from a holistic Google search and that was where my patient pool was coming from. A lot of that was just rampant decay because to be honest, a lot of the people that just fall into holistic on that kind of crunchy mom's Facebook page tend to be the more natural, don't use anything, um, watch things, milk's okay as long as we do raw. Um, and, and there's a lot of disease that happens because there's not oversight from the doctor. Now I tend to have most of my patients finding me mainly from word of mouth and then also referrals from functional medicine doctors that they're seeing. So it's changed completely. I've got a lot of patients that have a lot of autoimmune things or are dealing with brain fog, hives consistently, MS, things like that. And so now it's looking with a different set of eyes. So it's not just truly looking at decay. A lot of it is a lot of root canal teeth, titanium implants. We have wisdom teeth extracted and is there potentially infections in the sites of the extraction sites? And how do we handle that so that we can try to bring the toxic burden down below threshold? Okay. So like, okay. So do you, so your patient load is, I feel like in any kind of functional space, it is all over the, the all over the place. It's all connected, but it's all over the place. So if walk us through what it would look like for um, a typical first appointment with you, if I were a patient. Yeah. So um, for my first appointment, typically it is that we bring the patient in, we take a 3D code. Guys, can you hear this beeping on your end? I'm, yeah, I know the sound. We just lost it. I can't. Um, actually, <clears throat> I thought we lost it a little bit, but then uh, I, I, I think we're back. You, yeah. you hear me again? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so we start with the brain patient and we take a 3D cone beam that allows me to see the hard structures of the patient and then any of the air filled spaces as well. So it's of the head and neck ultimately to typically about C3, the vertebrae. And then um, what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the airway, the size of the garden hose back in the back of the throat where patients are meant to breathe. That comes from the nasopharynx to the laryngeopharynx. And then we're looking at the teeth themselves in the bone. Is there any abscess? Is there any sign of infection? And then in areas where there's root canal teeth, we're looking at, is there any infection going on there? And the areas where patients have had extracted wisdom teeth, we're also looking at, are there signs of potential cavitation lesions? The cavitation lesions are truly the medical definition as fatty degeneration, osteonecrosis of the jawbone. What that is, is it's a residual infection that gets walled off in the jawbone um, after a tooth is extracted. And we're not completely sure why that happens, if it's decreased blood flow, if it's remaining periodontal ligament, the area that houses the tooth and the bone, but we can have these increased infection areas they end up increasing a chemokine that you guys may have heard of called Rantes. Rantes is connected with almost every chronic inflammatory disease, and it increases fivefold when those are in the jawbone. And so if I've got a patient that is suffering brain fog, has unanswered disease, is trying everything and can't figure out what's going on, I'm looking specifically at those areas. When I have a patient come in who's a 25-year-old, feels great, no problems. I'm really not fully addressing that. I mean, I might take note if something looks blatant on an x-ray, but I'm really not saying, okay, everybody that had wisdom teeth needs to get these areas cleaned out. So when they come in, we take full series of photos. We take a full series of x-rays and a 3D CBCT. I then do a comprehensive exam that looks at all of the soft tissue and hard tissue areas of their oral cavity basically. And so I'm checking the TM joint. I'm also checking to see what the size of the airway looks like, how much tissue is hanging in the way, are the tonsils enlarged. Um, I'm looking at teeth as well and then the gum tissue to see what the periodontion looks like. Gotcha. So then I, I think that kind of explains a little bit, but if 
there's a term airway dentistry. So is that kind of when you're looking at those, the pieces you had mentioned earlier? So, so it is, but if we look back at like 300, 400 years ago at what skulls looked like anthropologically, they were much more forward facing or prognathic. And so as a civilization, because of industrialization and processing of food, and then just allergens in the air now, um, our faces are falling backwards. And so when your face falls backwards, when the bony structures don't grow forward and out like they're supposed to, they fall back into the airway space. And so now what may have been a really large garden hose, some patients only have like the size of a coffee straw to breathe out of. And so it's looking at how you can change that for patients. So in a child, it's much easier because you have growth and development still happening. And so you can use pressure and you can use force to change where the bones are going. In an adult, you really don't have that ability. It's more so trying to just create a bigger box in the mouth to house the tongue, to make the palatal tissue tighter. Um, but you can't really change growth and development. You can change the box a little bit, but not as significantly. And so, and so when you're changing that on young kids, I mean, that's, I'm assuming that's things like braces, retainers. Is that what you're, the tools you're using or? So it's mainly expanders. So you'll need braces to align teeth, but what we're really changing the bony structure. And so typically that's expanders. Oh, that expanders. Are, okay. Yeah. That are making an intramolar with meaning from the molar to the molar on the other side at the gum tissue line. We're wanting to bring that out to about 40 millimeters at least. When we look back at skulls, um, 50 to 55 is the width between the wisdom teeth and all wisdom teeth used to fit into a patient's mouth. And so it's only been kind of in our industrial era in our newer civilization that we've started to need to have wisdom teeth. So if you, so someone that has wisdom teeth and has the space for the wisdom teeth, do you, you recommend keeping them then? I do, I do. And even in patients that they might be slightly compromised, if we can get an orthodontist or an oral surgeon that's on board with us, that can widen the arch enough that the teeth can continue to erupt. I'm really not a fan of extraction teeth. So the reason why is because even when we do everything right, there's still a chance for that fatty degeneration, osteonecrosis of the jawbone to occur. And I feel like in our world, we are already burdened so much with chemicals and toxicities that if I can do one less thing to maybe pile on top of a patient, it's going to be better. Um, in, that, in that regard, however, obviously if a patient can't clean well, the tooth can't erupt fully. So now there's a space that's open for the bacteria to penetrate into that bone marrow area. I don't like that either. So in the perfect situation, yes, I keep wisdom teeth. In a situation that's not ideal and we can't get them into an ideal position, I do recommend the extraction. <clears throat> Doc, if, I, if I'm hearing this correctly, uh, we're looking at the structure, we're looking at the function, and we're looking at the root cause. Exactly. Same exact process as what I practice in the functional, holistic, regenerative model. Yeah. Different field, similar idea. Yeah, exactly. So just looking at not only what the disease is, but why is the disease occurring? And so same thing that you're doing. Well, um, for me, I think I probably think similarly to what you think. I think that mineral deficiency is a big problem for our society as a whole. Um, I also think that we are just toxic burdened. There's just too much coming at us. So I think that if methylation and detox pathways are open and they're working well, patients can handle a lot. But a lot of people don't have good methylation pathways. They don't have good detox pathways. And so I think it's just really easy for all of that to build up and start to just cause haywire in the system as a whole. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, you know, I don't hear those kind of expressions and phrases from any of my, from my MMD colleagues uh, and uh, even more so from my dental uh, colleagues. Uh, so for to, to actually to get that concept, to get that breadth, uh, breadth of experience uh, in <clears throat> not just the 
looking working looking at the teeth uh, from the conventional standpoint uh, but literally the root cause and uh, yeah. that, that's wonderful yeah well you've probably heard of weston price right yeah weston a price yeah, yeah. He's kind of like the father of biologic dentistry, right? The beginning of it, um, going around and looking at why do people have decay, right? And what's the, what societies and what groups of people don't have decay and what's different with them? And a lot of it came down to vitamins specifically. Vitamin, I think, C, B3, K2, and vitamin A are known to be things that are helpful for tooth. And so we've been taught in dentistry, like I was taught that the tooth can't regenerate, yet it's a living organ. So that doesn't really make sense. Why can't it regenerate, right? When we get a cut on our finger, that heals. So why can't we heal the tooth? And I have a lot of patients come in and ask me, do you do fillings or can you heal teeth? And I said, I'm trying to heal teeth, but it's not working. I said, I don't think in our current situation with everything that we're overloaded with, it's possible to lay down enough tooth structure to combat the bacterial attack that's eating away tooth structure. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of books out there that may speak to being able to heal things on your own. I know that in my modality with using ozone, with using laser, with trying with minerals and with trying with vitamins as well, I'm still not seeing it. Hit or miss, sometimes I can prevent a cavity from getting larger when it hasn't touched the internal structure of the tooth yet. Sometimes I can't. And on my side, like you, when you work with patients, um, the only thing you can do is you can educate them on what to do. What they then go and do at home is up to them. And so I may send vitamins and minerals. They may get taken one day out of seven days. And I'm not keeping tabs on people like, hey, are you really following all of my specifications every day? Right, you, you can only go so far, and then that's it. Then the the onus is on them. Uh, yeah. This is where, uh, in in the holistic dentistry, um, I'm sure, uh, as in holistic uh, field of any nature, uh, medicine especially, you have to have uh, response ability, accountability, and basically self motivation. Literally, uh, you have to want to get better, not just follow a either a prescription or a procedure and then okay well the doctor uh, didn't say anything else i guess that's it you know right. yeah. yeah yeah i agree with that and, and a lot of people i think do want to get well but then a lot of the patients that are coming through functional medicine as well are already getting so much from their md um and then for me on top of that sometimes i tail back at that point in time because I can't inundate a patient either. So if they're already trying 15 different detox things and everything, I kind of just step back on my side and, and figure that hopefully functional medicine is covering the things that I need the patient to do. Because the last thing I need to do is lay 20 things on them and then they don't do anything. So. <laughs> yeah, that can get really overwhelming for a patient because there are so many things that can be done that should be done, that we want to see done, but yeah, it can really start getting very layered and very nuanced and yeah, so I, I totally get why you maybe would just step back and say, okay, let's see how that that's going to play out with that side of things. 100%. Uh, when <clears throat> Rachel and I started working together, and this was some time ago now, we go back a while now, um, one of the things that Rachel has done for me uh, is to help me be more understandable to the patient. Uh, in other words, uh, <clears throat> the trouble is, um, and I think you remember some of those days, uh, <laughs> uh, I would have somebody, I would have a three-hour consultation visit. I would literally put an entire plan of action from A to Z. And just uh, to me, it's beautiful. It's just as a package. I can see how from this from this point through this uh, mess, you're going to get to that point, And then I outline it all. And it's just all of a sudden. And then people's faces go, oh, I'm confused. You know, I mean, that's a... Uh, Okay, Doc, you think you lost me, you know, so basically, and then it's uh, everything I said for the past three hours, it means absolutely nothing. So what Rachel actually has taught me is how to take a lot of that information, 
and literally, literally make it accessible and useful to the, to the client. In other words, what are the what are the things that are reasonable at this stage in the game, this step, that step? And so and this is what we've been working on systems that allow not just to understand it can be done, but this is how it should be done in the best. Well, and so one of the big strengths that Dr. Soren has is that he's very good at working with other practitioners and other fields and things. And so do you, do you have like a set, you have somebody that you work with closely kind yeah. of in that functional medicine space or? I do. I have a few providers that I specifically refer out to and that refer back patients to me. If they're seeing patients having silver mercury fillings or know that they're struggling with things, think that maybe they might have some root canals or maybe they have some cavitation lesions. So I do have those providers that I work hand in hand with. You guys still there? Can you guys hear me still? Hello. Hello, hello. You guys there? And we're back. <laughs> <laughs> you froze. <laughs> yeah. And I and I'm not sure at what point we uh oh so we were saying you, you do have some doctors that you kind of work back and forth with? I do. I have some functional integrative providers that I send to and that send back to me. So specifically, if they're seeing that patients have silver mercury fillings or they know that they maybe have some root canal teeth, they want me to look at it, or they suspect maybe there might be some cavitation lesions, then they'll send to me. And so that way I can help the patients on my side. Okay. So yes. So root canals, that's because I've I feel like we hear that a lot in our patients. And so kind of tell us, are root canals a good option to save a tooth or what's kind of give us your take on that? Good so yeah. at this point in my career, I don't think that they are. Um, I think that anytime you have a necrotic organ, you amputate, you take that organ out. Are you guys still able to hear me? I think you froze again. I'm going to start that okay, over. Uh... <laughs> we're back. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're going to try. We've been having okay. some internet issues. So now, uh, according to this, actually, it says end stream. So we could be still on, uh, possibly. Uh, well, and we're she's frozen on that screen, but we're talking on this screen. So I don't know. <laughs> back on. I well, can see you guys. Have to no matter what, uh, this, we're not giving <laughs> up. Uh, that's just uh, <laughs> what, what I say to every to my, all my clients. Uh, I, we never give up, whatever it takes to make it work. Make uh, it, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah and I, 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 this, I need an answer to this question. <laughs> Oh my, my yeah. God, yes. Um, so hey, I think we're back on. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so tell us root canals. Root canals, yeah. yes. Yeah, so at this point in my career, I don't think that they're a smart idea. I think that, like I said, if people have good methylation and detox pathways, I don't think a root canal will necessarily harm them. But I think it increases the pathogenic bacteria that are in the body. And I am sending those root canal teeth or any extracted teeth for actual like lab analysis. And they're coming back with some pretty pathogenic bugs and a lot of them. Um, and so really I think that when you take a necrotic organ and then you remove blood vasculature, you remove the nerve, you remove lymphatics, you basically just make a zone where the bacteria can pleomorph and cause problems. And so now you've got that running rampant. Now you're increasing cytokines and inflammatory cascade in the patient. 
And I think it just sets them up for disease. There is a lot that correlates with different areas of root canal teeth that then line up with whether it's heart disease or breast cancer in the same side as the root canal treated tooth. And so for me, if there's anybody that's having any sort of medical unknown, it is a no brainer that you get those teeth out of there. Yeah, because I don't know enough about root canals to know what what the alternative would be. Mm -hmm. So the alternative is then to not have a tooth in the space, one, or to replace the tooth with an implant or with a bridge. Now, the downside with an implant, depending on how thick the patient is, is that it's still artificial. And so um, I'm personally not a fan of titanium implants. They're going to take the majority of the market is titanium implants. But as you may know, there is titanium toxicity. There are problems with titanium that we're seeing in people. And so I personally place zirconia implants myself. I use a system called Swiss Dental Solutions. Another good one is CeraRoot. Um, they are very biocompatible. However, they're still artificial, right? It's something man-made that we're screwing into the bone. So if it's a really sick person, I think you just get the root canal teeth out. You see how the person responds, and then down the road, potentially, if they're well enough, then you place implants. If it's somebody that's well, but there's an abscess under the area, I'm fine placing an implant at that point in time. Um, but in sick patients, I'd prefer to kind of deburden the system as much as possible, see how the body responds, and then decide what you're going to do tooth wise down the road. And this may be um, a question with too many variables and directions, but what would the time frame on that generally look like so, so you know how they're going to respond? Um, well, a lot of these patients, as you guys know, are really sick. So it may take a year, two years with functional medicine to get through things. It just depends on how quickly you can detox them, get them methylating well, or change their diet, or change their mindset or deal with the emotional traumas that they have, whatever might be some of the burden that they have on them. I just, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that answer because that is the hardest part. I think about kind of the field that we're in is it takes time. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many times we have patients say, well, I tried that. It didn't do anything. And it's, I tried that for a month, two months. Mm. It's like, well, that's, that's not generally the time frame <laughs> can be, but not always. Yeah. The other thing too is, uh, is the expectation and belief systems. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's actually a friend of mine has a phrase for or abbreviation for belief system, basically BS. Uh, you know, most of people's belief systems are really truly BS. Uh, if you believe that things are supposed to go bad, they're going to go bad. If you believe that you're not supposed to have teeth when you're a certain age, chances are are you won't have teeth actually speaking of that uh, <clears throat> and, if, and I think of course this question goes deeper than just teeth I mean it's about who we are spirit soul mind body mental emotional which which is the control center what I call and that's what we work on uh, as well with, with with people first and foremost and then there's physical patterns as you described biochemical patterns cellular patterns physical patterns and also uh, uh, psycho uh, uh, psychosocial emotional and uh, just everyday life energy patterns that are basically affecting everything uh, uh, but uh, speaking of uh, is it uh, let's let's uh, let's get to some really simple silly questions uh, now uh, what about tooth decay uh, and uh, is it important to brush and to floss between the teeth uh, what else would you say on that topic uh, yeah so I think that in this day and age yes you need to brush and, brush and floss because everybody eats processed foods even if you're gluten-free you have healthy junk food which is still processed um, if you completely are more like the Neanderthal ancestors that we had. Um, do I think that you need to brush and floss? No, I really don't think you did. Um, they didn't. There really isn't sign of decay in any of the teeth. There's wear on the teeth, but there's not decay. And so, you know, it's not like they had toothbrushes. They were probably gnawing bones, gnawing meat, having a little bit of fruit and vegetables, um, but that was their whole diet. So I'm gonna I'm gonna 
throw myself under the bus here a little bit. So the brush and floss piece, I'm like, what if instead of flossing, you use a water pick? Because I much prefer that. <laughs> so the water pick's really good for gum tissue. So for decreasing inflammation in the gum tissue, it's great. However, it's not good at getting the biofilm off where the two teeth contact. And so that's where floss comes in. And so some patients have more bacteria that cause problems with tooth decay. Some patients have more bacteria that cause problems with the gum tissue itself. So I've had patients that have really bad periodontal or gum tissue bacteria, but have no decay, period, in between the teeth. And then I have patients on the flip side of that that have a lot of decay in between the teeth. They don't floss, but they have no periodontal problems, no gum tissue problems. And so um, me personally, I know you're not going to like this answer, Rachel, but I think the best approach is to use a water pick and floss. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a lot of work. And I know, I know. <laughs> I just, okay, I just needed to be reminded. I, but I will say, honestly, I water pick only when there's something that really irritates me in my gums and I want to, like, get it out. Other than that, I don't water pick every day. Um, I floss. I keep the floss by the TV. So not the most attractive, right? From when company comes over and everything and not cool for your spouse when they're sitting on the couch next to you and you're flossing your teeth. But I find that I don't even want to brush my teeth at nighttime when I'm tired and want to go to bed. I'm definitely not going to floss. And so if I have the floss there while I'm doing my like cool down routine of watching TV and vegging out, that's fine. Then I've done the flossing. I don't have another thing on my list. And then brushing is quick and easy. Okay, so now, <laughs> boy, I'm really letting my laziness shine through here. Um, once a day is okay, though, right? I don't need to do it twice no, a day. No, flossing or brushing? <laughs> Which one are you asking? Oh, well, let's go with both. How about both? With brushing, <laughs> you want to do twice a day. Really, what's more important is the nighttime brushing than necessarily the morning brushing. However, you probably want to brush the stuff off of your teeth and not have morning breath when you go to work and meet people. So um, I think brushing is important twice a day. Flossing, I think you can get away with one time a day. I don't think you need to do it twice. Okay. Yeah, that was my real, that was where I was headed with that was with yeah. the flossing. So. And you'll know, I mean, you'll like know. this is, anybody that doesn't floss regularly, if you do floss, then you'll smell that it smells like the bacteria, the biofilm that you pull off of the teeth. If you're flossing every day, you don't get that nasty smell where it's like, ooh, what's going on there? So... And, uh, and there's, there's actually another phrase that kind of comes to mind, uh, you know, silly, but, uh, you know, just uh, uh, something about a patient asking a dentist, uh, you know, which, uh, hey, doc, uh, how many uh, which uh, how many teeth do I need to floss between, uh, basically? So, and, the, and the answer was something like, you know, as many as you want to keep, right? Uh, so something just of that Just the ones you want to keep. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, okay, so speaking of flossing and how that can kind of break up that biofilm, I'm understanding that correctly. And you said you do something where you can send off for essentially evaluating the bacteria yeah. in the mouth. So I do kind of uh, an oral lab test with a company called DNA Connections. And so you can actually send the tooth itself off and patients can do this on their own as well. Um, or they can send off floss that they floss in between the teeth and down in the sulcus around that tooth. So they can either take the tooth themselves and run that, or they can take a piece of floss and run that. So for patients that, you know, maybe come into me and want a biologic approach or a holistic approach to dentistry, but they have seven root canal teeth and they have no idea that root canals could be a problem. Um, obviously I bring that up to them, but that's a hard pill to swallow when you come in and you just want your mercury is removed or something like that. And then the dentist is saying, well, you've got these seven root canal teeth. These ones show signs of infections underneath. These ones don't. Um, if you really want to be healthy, I think the best road to that is not having the root canals in your mouth. So for those patients, we can send pre-extraction to see how bad are these bugs? What do these bugs cause? And then it gives the patient some information to say, okay, this is worth it to me, or this isn't worth it to me. And so we've got a few of them that they haven't committed to doing it themselves, but I've put it out there where I'm saying, hey, it may be worthwhile 
for you to take a look at this. So that way you have more information to decide because right now you're thinking, oh my God, how do I take out seven of my teeth and what is the cost of that? Uh, one other question that I'd like to uh, make sure that we address, and by the way, we'll have a, uh, in, a in a little bit, uh, we'll have um, somebody just uh, jump on with us. Uh, the name is Ch Chuck Renner, one of the most uh, wonderful occupational field, OT, PT, and we'll talk about uh, another topic uh, as well. But I did want to uh, talk to you uh, and ask you, because this is, uh, you're one of the few people that I can actually talk to you about in the dental industry about this. Uh, you mentioned about the fluoride, and fluoride has been a part of the dental American Dental Association and dental industry for a long time, and I believe it still is as a, as a policy. And uh, you've said something about that. Let's talk about that, uh, and as well as some other environmental poisons that you see that are, you're yeah. concerned about. So for me, I, I don't believe that fluoride has the research that the ADA says that it does, that it decreases decay. Um, I personally think that it is a neurotoxin. There's a lot of research that shows that. Um, it also replaces in the bone as well for calcium. And so it's making brittle spots in bone. Um, we see it in teeth, right? In dental school, we were taught that a patient that has excess fluoride will have fluorosis and the teeth are modeled. Um, and that's something that was just told to us as something that's okay and that's fine. Um, I personally think that you can do things to decrease decay that are not fluoride. Since I, I personally use toothpaste with nanohydroxyapatite in them, so hydroxyapatite is what makes up tooth structure. So when you have a toothpaste with it in there, when you have demineralization from acid attack from the bacteria, you then have that readily absorbable to be absorbed by the tooth and hopefully recalcify the tooth. And so that's what I use. We don't use fluoride in our practice at all. It's not in our cleaning paste. It's not something that I recommend to patients or prescribe. However, I'm in Austin, Texas. Austin does fluoridate the water. Um, so any of the patients that are drinking water from the city are having fluoridated water. I personally use distilled water at home to make sure that me and my children are not being exposed to anything. But I will say even on that 3D CBCT, fluoride is one of the big things. And one of the things that's known to do is calcify the pineal gland. I can actually see that on my CBCT. I can see the calcification of the pineal gland on the patient. And I tell you, probably... Could you, repeat, could you could you repeat that? I wasn't there was some background noise and I couldn't hear that. So you could you can see you were talking about calcification of the yeah. pineal gland and that you can see that. I couldn't yeah. catch on my 3D yeah. cone beam because it's looking at things that are more dense or harder in structure. When the pineal gland is calcified, it actually comes up as like a white spot in the middle of the head for me. And so I can see that and I tell you probably about 95% of my patients have calcified pineal glands. So um, whether that's fluoride or other things in conjunction with that, I'm not sure. But just a finding that, you know, huh, interesting, calcified pineal gland here. And uh, as you said, you know, pineal is one of the most important structures uh, in, in our bodies, literally. Not only is it sleep and melatonin, but it's also, uh, it, there's it's one of the regulatory hormones, uh, hormonal centers, uh, plus, uh, plus uh, the... Uh, well, uh, pineal is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, has been referred to as the uh, third eye, so to speak, uh, and on a, in a metaphysical sense, uh, you know, in terms of mental, emotional, uh, spiritual, physical, uh, and again, there's so much we can say about that. And there's thoughts about, you know, why are there all these things in in dentistry or in medicine, right? Is Is there some outlier that's trying to maybe keep us from having that metaphysical and spiritual? Is there a reason that we're fluoridating things to disconnect us from source and to make it more likely that we don't know and don't have this true intuition? So we kind of follow blindly what's being told to us. And there, Doc, you <laughs> said <I do. laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is exactly what I've been talking about as well. We had a program uh, recently. Um, uh, it, 
so far it's still out there it it, it has you know it's still being aired uh on the matrix uh, of yeah. the world mm -hmm. and uh and, and the medical system and everything else uh, and it's an interesting program again it's my take again it's a, it's that uh, i'm not saying this is no, this is everybody's truth but this is my this is my reality and we're talking about basically the fact uh, of awakening to health to wellness but also to a greater reality of the world that we're in and we don't really understand the world that we are in and now i can go and take this in, down a rabbit hole as far as we can take uh, go but rachel is here to kind of well, I, yeah i'm gonna so <laughs> this is still on topic this is a question that we have and this yeah. may be between you guys can both address this topic potentially yes. how do you decalcify the pineal the pineal gland no well, uh, to me, uh, I, I love the idea of IV chelation. In other words, one of the things that's the, that are my favorite the suggestion, we do this here, is uh, it's an EDTA, it's, a, uh, it, it's great for the metals, it's, it's great for the toxins, it's also great to take uh, the stuff away from the body that is really hurting us, including calcifications. Now, uh, pineal calcifications are a pretty significant situation, and I would love to do a pre and post uh, with a full uh, chelation program. Uh uh, what, what's your experience? That? that would be interesting if you could see. So I always just say your pineal gland is showing some calcification. Um, I would recommend that you speak to functional medicine to see how to handle that. So for me, in my world, the only thing I know is iodine. Um, beyond that, I'm not really sure what else patients can do other than let's not fluoridate you further and cause more harm. So I kind of punt that to my medical professionals and don't take on any of that myself. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I guess if we have another quick question, so when you hear uh, in a dental uh, uh, in a dental field, silver teeth or silver feelings, uh, what does that mean to you? Because again, I, and I already know where I'm going with this, yeah. uh, but that's mercury. It is. It's greater than 50% mercury. So it's a silver tin mercury amalgamation is what amalgam is. And so um, what we were taught in dental school is that once it's bound, it's fine. Um, it's not. I mean, mercury is the most toxic, non-radioactive metal. There's no reason it should be in the human body. And so um, it is off-gassing. And there are videos that you can search online on YouTube that'll show like a mercury filling being rubbed with just an eraser and then the vapors that are coming off of that. Um, and so that's off-gassing all of the time and you're absorbing all of that. And so we do do a safe mercury removal procedure, which is basically covering the patient completely, putting a rubber dam around the tooth so that none of the mercury dust is being free in the mouth. Um, there's like a big elephant suction vacuum that comes right up to the face. Um, they're on oxygen and then their face is draped as well. For us, some providers will wear gas masks. Um, in my practice, we don't wear a gas mask because it's just too much bulk on my face. We do use what's called charcoal masks, which are effective, maybe not as much as gas masks. So we are gowned ourselves and we are protected and then we have the charcoal masks on. We remove the mercury, we then take everything off, we sit the patient up, we break down the room, we clean everything with mercury wipes, and then we bring in a new set of instruments to go ahead and fill those fillings after we remove the mercury. So um, a lot of my patients that come in come in specifically for that procedure and they come in with brain fog or they come in with problems with ms and they all come back telling me that they feel significantly better even like one that had the tiniest little filling right on the side of the tooth and then she's like oh this pain that i've had down my neck for like years went away and i'm like seriously one little filling like it still mm -hmm. blows my mind because me personally i had eight mercury mountain fillings in my mouth I became a biologic dentist. I didn't really care, honestly, about myself, but I did start to care when I was doing my research about my children, because I'm off-gassing to my kids constantly. And so I got them removed. Um, I had already been on a health journey of my own, and really from a young age, probably had quite a bit of brain fog, had a lot of sleep issues that I wasn't aware of, like tossed and turned all over the bed or with sleep. 10 hours and still wake up feeling groggy. But I just thought that was the reality of life. Um, when I got smarter with my diet 
And really, honestly, when I started to do a lot of vitamin D3 and also B100, um, there was a turn for me and the mental fog was gone. I often now will ask my patients, what is your critical thinking ability like from one to 10? Where are your energy levels from one to 10? My critical thinking most days is like a computer processor, I feel like. I feel like I can take a ton of information and just make things make sense. Whereas going through college and even high school, I had to study really hard and I still didn't do as well as I should have. And so I think that I had already become healthy prior to doing the mercury removals. So I didn't feel an impact. So for me, it's like eight, eight should have made me feel way different. And I felt no different. So when I have these patients coming and doing one mercury removal and telling me, oh my God, it made this pain down my neck go away. I'm going, wow, that's so weird. I had nothing change. So, <laughs> but I think it's because I had already found some sort of balance where I was below threshold. That is absolutely wonderful and, and, and important to know. So for anyone out there who has silver feelings or silver or mercury feelings, make sure you find a good biological dentist because if you don't take it out properly, it puts the dentist at risk uh, and they don't even realize what it is and it puts uh, the person at risk. And this is one of the best things that can be done. How much toxin, how much mercury does it take to cause uh, symptoms and damage and uh, ultimately degeneration, including Parkinson's and lots of others? It, it's it's not that much of an amount. Right. I mean, just that one little spot, right, was already yeah. causing some issues. So, so thank you. Just for that alone, I think it's, uh, you know, there's so many, you know, unique tidbits here in this conversation that I really, really love. And, uh, well, there's this is definitely one of them. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, but I think yeah, and so I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. Um, so, so the fluoride because we went kind of from the fluoride to the mercury, which were toxins in general. Um, some people may be wondering, oh, well, if I don't use fluoride, what what do I use? What's okay? What what works? Um, maybe you can ease our mind about some some yeah. options. So there are a lot of toothpaste on the market now. Um, you may not see them in the stores themselves, but you might have to search them online. Um, that are using nano hydroxyapatite. And that tends to be what all of your biologic dentists for the most part are going to. So um, there's a company called Risewell, which has a toothpaste with hydroxyapatite. There's a company called Boca that has nano hydroxyapatite. Um, there's a company called- I think we- <laughs> which... We're back. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so I was telling you there are toothpaste on the market now that have uh, hydroxyapatite. And so Japan, just in their entire history, has never used fluoride. They've always used hydroxyapatite. And so um, that's what most of your biologic dentists are using at this point in time. Uh, and there are companies called Risewell or Boca. There's another company called Bite that's out there. And they all have a hydroxyapatite toothpaste. There's a lot of places too that are making new pastes or powders and things like that with hydroxyapatite as well. So that's what I recommend for patients. Um, in addition, supplementation. So um, vitamin D3, K2 is a big one for me as well. Vitamin C also is important. So really my best advice for if you don't want decay is if it doesn't look like a plant or an animal, like from its natural source, don't eat it. So I and I want to back up to the cultural piece because you mentioned Japan and they've never used fluoride. So something else that I've just kind of, you know, I have never researched this deeply, but just sort of in passing, um, I, I, maybe India, I'm not even sure where this started, but oil pulling, that seems to be a popular thing. So, I mean, maybe you can tell us more about so, that. You know, I don't heard about that. Yeah. I think that oil pulling, at first I thought it was like out there, um, but I think that it's good. I think that anything that you're going to do that can help remove bacteria from the mouth is going to be helpful. And so I have seen changes in patients that are doing oil pulling where the gum tissue is healthier. And so can I say specifically that it will prevent a cavity from getting larger? I can't, but there's no harm in trying if you're a patient that's willing to do all the things. So if you're going to be compliant and you're going to brush and floss and oil pull and water pick, awesome. If oil pulling is going to make it so that way you don't want to do any of the rest of it either because it's just too much, then I think just kind of follow through with your normal brush floss. 
don't eat things in a box and take some minerals and vitamins. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, that actually leads me to another question because mouthwash. So, <laughs> Tell us <more>. so, <laughs> That's a simple question, but it's a good question. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so yes. for mouthwash, um, there are mouthwashes that are going to be better for you than others that aren't going to have alcohol in them. I'm not really a fan of anything that's alcohol-based or specifically anything that has a lot of essential oils in it just because it can dry out the mouth. And so it can cause some problems. There's also some research out there. Um, and Nathan Bryan is somebody here in Austin. He's a big nitric oxide guy. And so uh, we all know nitric oxide is important to the body. Um, apparently, when we're using mouthwashes, and this even applies to the ozone that I use at the office too, we are killing off bacteria, right? And that is not going to be subjective to just pathogenic bacteria, but all bacteria, so some good ones as well. And so we're reducing nitric oxide loads that are produced by the bacteria. So I don't personally recommend mouthwash for any of So, oh, good. That's one thing yeah. we can skip. Yeah. So if anything, I tell patients <laughs> to put like a, because I'm big on nasal lavage since we all have a lot of sinus congestion and things. And so we have like a water flosser in the office that has a nasal tip that can go on it as well. And so I just tell them, Put the little saline rinse packet in your water and rinse your mouth with the saline water. And you can use it in your nose as well. Perfect. Gotcha. <laughs> I do uh, want to mention briefly, uh, we do have a, a few folks here in town that we really do appreciate. And Dr. Shili, uh, well, that's some of his favorites. Uh, uh, one is uh, Spring Valley. Great service, uh, carry a lot of uh, Dr. Shilly's favorites. We've been talking about supplements. We've been talking about uh, health-oriented folks who know what they're talking about. Uh, lots of products, great store here. And if you're going to get uh, good supplements, you make sure you get them at a proper place. In other words, a lot of the supermarkets and the pharmacies are not exactly great in terms of the quality of the stuff that's there. Um, so that's one. And uh, the other thing that I would like to mention as well is uh, is a tart cherry uh, juice concentrate. Uh, and again, if people <coughs> apologize, um, don't uh, want to have their adequate uh, fruit of uh, veggie intake, which should be the, the primary thing that we do, uh, literally, and it's great for the teeth, uh, um, then you really at least have got to do something to supplement for that. And that's uh, tart cherry juice concentrate is really wonderful for that. Anti-inflammatory, great for various things. Again, power of nature. If you let mm, nature be your medicine or um, well, let food be thy medicine or otherwise thy medicine will become thy food, uh, literally. Just a brief reminder from Dr. Shili, and uh, he would always me to, to say these things. So back to uh, where we are. And uh, Rachel, anything else that we haven't? Um... I'm just, I just want to make sure we didn't miss anything. Is there anything mm -hmm. else that people should know if they're thinking about switching, you know, to over to a biologic dentist? Um, any other, I mean, I know we covered a lot of stuff. So any other pertinent facts or pieces of knowledge or questions they may have that you answer a lot? So I think it's important to know that when you go to a biologic dentist, there's a spectrum of where we are in our training. And so um, really having some idea of what you're looking for. Are you looking for safe mercury removal? Um, there are sites that you can look at on the IAOMT or the IABDM, and you can find out if these people are certified to remove mercury safely. But also asking your providers, do you use ozone? What are your thoughts on root canals? Things like that. Um, you're going to see where in the continuum your doctor is in their learning process. And so um, it is a lot more extensive when you come to a biologic dentist because it's no longer just that you have this disease. Like, okay, there's a cavity on 231, right? It's like, okay, there's this cavity on 231. I'm seeing this infection here. Your airway is small. Things like that. We don't deliver it just like that, but patients go, oh my God, that's a lot. Kind of like you were speaking to where Rachel's helping you figure that out. Um, it's a lot. And I have to baby step things back to patients. Don't get overwhelmed. I'm discussing all of the things I see with you, but we will plan this so that way it's only a little bit at a time because otherwise it can get overwhelming. One, cost-wise, 
and two, just information overload. So if you don't know these things already and you come in and all you're used to is like getting your teeth buffed and shined and having the doctor tell you there's a hole here, it's a different experience. And so just be ready for that. Understand that it doesn't mean you have to do everything tomorrow, but we're looking at how we can best help you health-wise long-term and we can help stage that for you so that it's not inundating. That's that's perfect. That's so helpful. Thank um, you, Doc. Yeah, I appreciate thank you, you so much for all your wonderful information. I think people are going to find it really, really helpful. Thank um, you. Do, is there? Can we? Should we put your website or what? How do you want if people want to reach yeah, out? Yeah. So, you? Um, if anybody wants to reach out to me specifically with questions, they can email to info at brunodentistry.com. Um, my website is brunodentistry.com. Um, I do have an Instagram. And I do have a Facebook page. Um, I will be honest with you, I am not big on social media. So they exist, but if you want to get in touch with me, the best way is to email to info at Bruno Danish. Okay, we will post that in the comments. Thank you so much for coming Thanks. on. Um, Thanks, Doc. And what I'm seeing is over and over again, a holistic mindset is a holistic mindset, whether it be dentistry, functional medicine, or anything else. Thank you for the shining Exactly. Delight. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you, thank you. And then for our viewers, we are gonna have Dr. Chuck Renner pop in for just a second so we can preview for next week. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys do and yes, Chuck please. do this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you so very Sorry. much. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, Chuck, uh, would you like to come in for just a sec, please? Yes. let's uh okay let's just say that one more time okay Shaka, so we just started something if you're hearing this twice so this is good because it's good information so uh, you can hear Shaka today you're gonna hear him next week so this is not the last please <clears throat> so we're going to talk about advanced spinal decompression spinal decompression is a way that we can conservatively treat spine care whether it's cervical spine lumbar spine so if you have a herniated disc a bulging disc spinal stenosis degenerative joint disease spondylosis so many issues that we can help treat conservatively there's also a lot of actual research that i'll share with you next week that show the success rate of relieving back pain from spinal decompression versus relieving back pain through surgery and surgical interventions and it's it's really exciting it's it's a it's kind of a booming area right now in conservative spine care and there's a reason for that and the reason is it works and it's natural it's non-invasive and i'm super excited about talking to you guys next week chuck it's a pleasure we got another wonderful topic coming up guys and girls and uh thank you for being here so next time thanks <laughs>